the reason I ask this is how do you even define surveillance? Well, no Indian act that I'm I'm not a lawyer, but that from what I know, no Indian act or there's no legal definition of surveillance. You do have definitions of lawful interception under the Telegraph Act, under the IT Act. You can intercept communications. That's only informational part of it. But surveillance is not entirely about information. Well, you do collect information as as part of the process, but it's not primarily about so there are various forms of information that you're collecting and it's not always about interception. It's probably also creating of information if a photograph is being captured. So I come from a urban studies background, I'm a civil engineer, so I used to work on smart cities. Uh, so that this concept of natural surveillance, uh, which is widely known in urban studies. I don't know if you know about Jane Jacobs. Uh, Jane Jacobs was an architect with, who fought uh, against big building mafia in New York. Uh, she was against all highways. In some ways, she was against technology being used against the poor because she thought the way the city functions, the way people care about each other was was something good which needs to be cherished. Uh, the reason I bring this is national surveillance is basically people just looking at each other. So if if one of your friends is actually taking care of you in the campus, it's a form of national surveillance. And this is not bad. It need not be bad. So surveillance can be good. It, it depends on what kind of surveillance you're saying is bad. And the kind of surveillance that now we want the government uh, to regulate or the parliament to enact it for legislation is that which intrudes into people's life. And while there is a lot of debate, a lot of criticism that this is a data protection act, there should be a separate surveillance legislation. Uh, well, there is a part of data where which can be used for surveillance and that part of data needs to be regulated. How you do it is, again, it's contestable, but let's look at how surveillance happens. How many of you know the state capacity of surveillance in India? Well, we do, you do know that there are surveillance cameras, but there is also different forms of surveillance, like metadata surveillance, uh, interception, and there is, of course, fiscal surveillance. And bringing all of this under one act probably will be a challenge without actually knowing what what forms of surveillance is the state carrying out. So if you actually look at uh, some of the reports, even what is publicly available through leaks, uh, the Indian government invited a firm called Hacking Team back in 2006 uh, to bring surveillance capabilities within RAW, with, for IE, MHA and RAW. Uh, Hacking Team is some form of a Cambridge Analytica company, very old school, and they use uh, zero days to basically uh, go after anybody, pretty much anybody, cell phones and browsers. Uh, they can insert child porn onto your browser and claim that you were watching child porn. So now this form of surveillance is intrusive uh, surveillance. It's not just surveillance, it's going beyond surveillance and actually planting wrongful evidence which thankfully our evidence act recognizes by the way. So what sort of surveillance are we talking about? Everything and anything and one can't really say that this surveillance is okay or this surveillance is bad. The act, the act of harm is the theory around harm. How, how do you prove what harm has been done? Needs to evolve and frankly nobody knows how you can convince a judge that look, this evidence was planted digitally onto me. So, going back to the usage of surveillance, it's not just the state has this capacity and it's going to use this for wrong. We have, it has been used to do wrong. Political surveillance in India has always been carried out since ages using ID. Uh, you would, you look at, um, if you look at instances of uh, 
national political parties in power using their infrastructure to look at what the opposition is doing. Or in fact, the current uh, social media surveillance that the national political party is doing where they have around 600 people in a huge center where they're tracking everybody's social media account. Uh, again, completely illegal, but the election commission doesn't care about it as of now. So, there has been instances in the past, again in AD and Telangana, where chief ministers, CMO officers started surveilling each other, hacking each other. I don't know if you were aware of it, but uh, Chandrababu Naidu actually filed a complaint with the MHA saying that how a constitutional authority like him be under surveillance. So immediately after he, uh, he there was a phone interception of his, him with his uh, colleague in uh, Telangana, AP Intelligence tried acquiring tech, interception tech from the hacking team. We know all of this because the hacking team got hacked and all of these emails were published by WikiLeaks. So it's interesting how if you track the nuances of how surveillance happens, uh, you can then start questioning if the government is doing this, if the government is actually using state surveillance for political gains, what's stopping the government from doing the same against activists? And that actually happened last week, two weeks ago. With the whole urban access debate, uh, I don't know if you forgot or if you haven't read the part where all of their artists, all of their digital accounts, IDs and passwords were confiscated from them post free. How can they do it? They pretty much can't. The constitution doesn't allow it, but because the police is police and we know how the country works, they're doing it. So to say that surveillance is good or bad is wrong, but to look at surveillance as something which is taking our rights is the way one needs to look at surveillance. If surveillance can be used to profit, which is what corporates do, to some extent it is allowed. And, and this is what the government wants to promote through its digital economy. But how can you do that without actually controlling these very entities, which may give back the same data during elections to the political party which they are close to? So, one can't really limit saying that surveillance is just for the state to surveil its citizens. There are different forms of it. Uh, you can actually start surveilling the government. If you start, I mean, that's what RTI wants to do. The power imbalance that is being created when the state is not giving back information to you while it's collecting everything back from you is what people are questioning. Nobody is saying that, hey, surveillance is outright wrong, you should stop doing it. There is a legitimate use case for surveillance and it needs to be allowed. People are only asking for it to be brought under a regulatory mechanism that it shouldn't be misused. Okay, so tomorrow if you have to convince a judge that Aadhaar is surveillance, which is what one of the petitioners have argued, that Aadhaar, the metadata which Aadhaar generates can be used to track citizens. And we have seen that this happen in states, especially in Andhra and Telangana, where the state governments have collected uh, all the information from citizens and they have started linking various different databases uh, with Aadhaar. Again, as Alan, uh, Alan was pointing out, the issue is aggregation of data. Okay, so if the data collection itself is it wrong, the state does has a legitimate interest and uh, if you have to convince a judge that the state can't do this, you probably will fail. The issue is that state can collect this data, but state is limited not to share this information and not to do certain things over this or with this data. So, in this context, what is important is as a society, it's not just about what laws. We are bringing in and it's also about what practices you let the government do and what practices you let the government go by. With the uh, past week arrest of the activists, uh, nobody has actually followed up on these digital conf uh, confiscations of their digital assets. And it's important because uh, the DPA, the DPA which is going to be formed under this act has the exact same provisions. 
they can barge into your house they can collect all your laptops all your digital devices and they don't have to answer to anybody okay so when you say you want a strong independent dpa i'm also not sure while at the same time i advocate for privacy i'm also concerned so a law needs to be just and it needs to be just in both ways it shouldn't be uh, even a just law can be used against people and i'm not questioning that uh, that that's a separate issue but the framing of the law itself is giving so much power and the whole idea about surveillance is this power imbalance surveilling the rich is good to the scam and sometimes the whole surveillance that nira radia team happened was good we we do now know that how power brokers in the country influence the government and that's a form of surveillance which is okay and it's a lawful surveillance in fact uh, what was the income tax yeah i mean see the to the scam uh, the, the nira radia team the surveillance was legal but the leaking of the tapes uh, was the part which was being questioned so nobody is saying that surveillance should be shut down and if you are making that argument to a judge you are not going to win okay so trying to understand how surveillance happens and how you can probably avert it how you can probably come around it how you can hold the state accountable is what one needs to look at and and that is what people are expecting even in this bill that the state shouldn't be given a free hand uh i won't go I'll, i'll slightly mention this some of the developments on taxation and uh, uh data collections and payments what happened with other i mean you can't look other mandatory other because you mandatory as a sole instance it was demonetization followed by other with push on cashless systems if you have to look at surveillance you can't look at one instance say hey aadhar is the only thing which is creating surveillance nobody is saying that aadhar combined with a push for digital uh, transactions with a lot of collection of personal information from citizens is what is creating this apprehension that the government is coming into our day to day life from your birth till your death because uh if you actually are uh, trying to conceive the government knows both of your uh, what the couple's other numbers before the baby is born and it's mandatory so what i'd like to conclude here is that you can look at surveillance as a monolithic entity at the government only the government or only the big five doing it big five corporations it's it's everybody doing it you are probably doing it in a, in your own neighborhood probably spying on uh, your friends and that's okay so long so you're not intruding into their very lives